This is a production of Cornell University. Great. Um, wow, thank you so much for coming out today. Um, the, I'm very excited to share some of the research I've been doing with Broccoli. Um, I'm going to be focusing on a paper that Thomas and I published in September, although we're going to delve into some other broccoli research as well along the way. Um, yeah, the story about my grandfather, he uh, was an agricultural engineer, and I was looking through some older papers where he was studying irrigation and cabbage, and I came across one of his work, which is kind of cool. Um, so. I've got a little bit of background I'd like to share, a crash course in broccoli. So broccoli is one of the most consumed green vegetables in the United States. Um, and it's a highly consumed vegetable worldwide. Um, so I, that doesn't mean french fries or ketchup as vegetables uh, in that case. Um, so currently, America produces about a billion dollars of broccoli a year in terms of farm gate value. Um, unlike many agronomic crops like maize or wheat, um, improve, breeding improved broccoli varieties is pretty challenging because we have this whole extra dimension called horticultural quality that we care about. Um, things like what's the aesthetic value of a particular head of broccoli what's the shape of the head is the head uniform is it smooth um, are the buds small those kinds of questions and those uh, traits tend to be complex and by that i mean maybe many genes control that phenotype um, there may be strong genotype by environment effects for those traits. Um, and there also may be epistatic interactions where expression of one gene influences expression of a different gene. So oftentimes these uh, types of um, improvement efforts are not straightforward from a traditional breeding standpoint. Um, the, the, the key goal of my work was put most simply is to find regions in the broccoli genome that are associated with horticultural traits that we care about. I'll use the term QTL for quantitative trait loci a lot. Um, when, and by that I mean genomic regions with a statistical association with a particular phenotype of interest. Um, so, the long-term goal of this work is ultimately to develop molecular markers that can be used to expedite and improve broccoli breeding efforts. So breeding broccoli that's locally adapted. Um, in general, we care about broccoli on the East Coast and specifically uh, New York. So these are, that is one potential long-term outcome of this work. Thomas and I spent a lot of time beforehand thinking about um, broccoli, discussing it, uh, all of the implications, and these are some of the goals we came up with. We wanted to understand uh, how much diversity there exists within broccoli. Um, is it all one and the same? What are the ways that it's different or can be different based on its different genotypes? Um, what are the flaws in horticultural quality that we see? Um, secondly, we know that we knew that we needed to produce really good molecular markers that cover the broccoli genome. Um, these needed to be reproducible and ideally could be shared with other researchers working on this particular crop. Um, we wanted to not just find QTL, but QTL models that best explain these important horticultural quality traits um, in, under a complex control hypothesis. There's going to be probably many genes interacting. What's the most parsimonious model we can get to explain uh, that variation that we see? And then this is such an exciting time to be in plant science. There's so many people working on so many different questions. 
um, people that are studying other brassica crops that are not broccoli, people that are working with Arabidopsis, which is in the same family. How can we leverage all of that work and information and apply it to uh, our particular questions? So those are some ideas that we had going into this work. Um, and I want to do something a little weird and start with the results. So we looked at uh, 25 horticultural traits in broccoli. And amongst those 25 traits, we found 56 um, QTL. And we also flagged 10 kind of genomic regions that seem to be especially important for high quality broccoli. Um, we were able to produce a really nice genetic map um, from this special mapping population, which I'm going to talk about. Um, the, those markers are reproducible and reusable for other researchers. It's an immortal mapping population, so you can save seed from every, every plant, and it's genetically identical to its parents. Those plants are now available by our friends at the USDA. So someone else that wants to study secondary plant metabolites, for example, could use this set of markers we made um, and the, the same plants and very quickly um, get some nice results. A kind of surprisingly unanswered question is, why does broccoli plants make broccoli heads? Um, well, we have lots of little pieces of information, but um, we, we ultimately don't really know. Um, the best QTL model for the broccoli heading phenotype that um, we produced from this analysis explains about 82% of the variance in a plant's ability to form a broccoli head, which is exciting. Um, we identified a number of candidate genes within these traits. It's important to note that um, this is preliminary work. We're not proving that this gene is causal. We're trying to make a smaller haystack for future work where someone could do a knockout experiment and confirm that that gene is essential for the phenotype. Um, so just very quick information about um, broccoli. It's in the Brassicacea family. There are 4,060 named species in Brassicacea. Um, and Arabidopsis is one of them. So that's great that it's uh, relatively closely related. So a lot of the information from Arabidopsis has the potential to be applied to broccoli, although there's a big asterisk there. Um, there are three diploid species in the Brassica genus. Um, all of those species can form tetraploid species by combining both of their genomes, which is pretty wild if you're not familiar with that phenomenon. Um, and Brassica oleracea itself contains many familiar vegetables and quite a few uh, vegetables that would be unfamiliar to most Americans. Um, and it was domesticated from a wild woody plant that's found in the Mediterranean basin. And over thousands of years, humans have selected um, these wild plants for many different horticultural quality traits. In the case of broccoli, um, larger stems and many more flower buds. So how did this domestication occur? Like I mentioned, those wild Oleracea types are found all throughout the Mediterranean basin. There's um, quite a few of them, they're on these small islands and rocky cliffs. From a Vavlovian perspective, um, our, our best guess about the domestication of broccoli is that it occurred in southern Italy and Sicily. There's uh, many, many, many um, landrace types that are still grown there to this day. Um, those landraces have a very high amount of genetic diversity compared to the modern hybrids that we see now. Um, this is a, a botanical illustration of broccoli from the 18th century. As you can tell, it looks 
pretty wildly different than the broccoli that we're familiar with to this day. And that's, you know, sort of a snapshot of how the improvement, domestication and improvement have transpired. The word broccoli we first see in, this, in a 17th century text, broccolo in Italian, and that is unclear if it means um, the, the diminutive form of a shoot or possibly a small nail. There's an older Latin word, brocus, which means to project. Um, so over the last 4,000 years, humans have made tremendous uh, improvements in broccoli. I, I think all brassicas are beautiful, um, but improvement, I mean, made the plant more so suitable for human use. So things from like breeding for a larger head, which translates to a higher yield, um, head characteristics, a more convex head shape um, with a smoother surface, flower buds, smaller flower buds that are very round, they can be uh, fit together in a more compact manner to make a more dense head. Certain things that may not be familiar to a consumer of broccoli, like plant architecture traits, how far does the head protrude above the leaf rosette, for example, um, has a pretty big consequence if you're trying to harvest a thousand acres, if you can just directly cut it off versus like, dig it out of the plant. Um, and believe it or not, upstate New York has a slightly different climate than Sicily. Uh, so, <laughs> Yet, you, it's still possible to grow broccoli here, and that's largely a function of humans breeding broccoli to be adapted to a wider range of climates. This is a picture of two broccolis that I grew in my field this summer. On the left is a Italian landrace that is still grown in Italy to this day, and on the right is a modern F1 hybrid broccoli. Um, so uh, obviously the most dramatic difference is one is way bigger, um, but additionally there's smaller, more uniform buds and this more beautiful convex head shape that we expect in broccoli. Um, Americans nowadays eat about 10 pounds of broccoli a year. Um, who has eaten broccoli in the last month? Um, a lot of people. We're in a safe place. Does anyone does anyone hate broccoli? One. Oh, we have one. Everyone is welcome here. <laughs> um, so yeah, before the 1950s, broccoli was basically an unheard of crop. It was brought here by Italian immigrants in the 20th century, and you couldn't really find it in grocery stores or markets. And over time, uh, consumers have gotten wise to how great it is, and consumption has trended upwards since then. Um, the traditional model of broccoli production has centered around uh, Southern California and Arizona, and how this typically works in order to ensure a year-round supply um, production will be based in Southern California and Arizona in the middle of the winter, and then production will shift northwards along these um, valleys along the coast, which remain relatively cool throughout the summer, and then the fall production will shift southward. Uh, note that this um, map was made in 2007. The story has changed quite a bit since then. Um, also note that to get broccoli to these East Coast markets requires a lot of time and fuel. So by the time broccoli is harvested in California and brought to the East Coast and is in your refrigerator, it can be a week to two weeks. So the head has lost a lot of nutritional value, flavor, and there's a really big carbon footprint associated with shipping it across the country. So this begs the question, why not grow it on the East Coast? Well, in 2010, Thomas and others got together this really wonderful um, project called the Eastern Broccoli Project, which is a collaboration of um, 
public and private groups, USDA, uh, universities, seed breeding companies, um, to develop an Eastern broccoli industry. Um, the philosophy is a strong broccoli industry in the Eastern US will result in a regional supply of a popular healthy food for consumers, lower transportation costs for retailers, and a market for a high value specialty crops for farmers. Um, so the idea is this model would kind of mirror that California production model where production would happen in southern Florida in the winter and shift northward towards the summer and then vice versa in the fall. Um, so the numbers are actually looking really good. Um, so this is some data that shows the number of farms on the east growing broccoli from 2012 to 2017. And every state has had an increase in the number of farms growing broccoli. Um, in New York, the number has increased from 290 to 535. So it's pretty, pretty uh, good news. What's the bottleneck? Why do you need an Eastern Broccoli Project? So the truth of the matter is when you grow California varieties of broccoli on the East Coast, they usually look terrible. Um, they were bred in California for California conditions. They're not adapted to the East Coast. Um, here we see a head of broccoli, a uh, broccoli plant that is not producing a head and will not produce a head. Um, here's a broccoli plant that is making something vaguely reminiscent of a head, um, but all broccoli is beautiful, but this one is le maybe less beautiful than others. It has a uh, very irregular head surface. There's these bracts that protrude through the head, um, and the color is this bizarre chartreuse color. So, uh, uh, food distributor would not buy this from a farmer, so it would be a direct loss. Here's some other bad broccolis, or as Thomas likes to refer to them, hashtag broccoli fail. Um, so this has more of the bracts, very irregular bud size. Some, you have these fully mature buds and um, immature buds kind of mixed together. Here's a uh, very asymmetrical head of broccoli grown on the East Coast. There's this uh, sepal defect here where the bud isn't fully closed. This is a very common problem. Here's some heads that look slightly better. Um, they have a very lumpy, irregular head surface, um, which is more than just cosmetic. Um, after ir overhead irrigation or a rain event, the head will not be able to shed that water and it can cause rotting to form. Even <coughs> droplets of water that remain on the top function as basically small magnifying glasses focusing the sun and can burn the head. Um, so what is this heading broccoli phenotype? Why is broccoli peculiar amongst all of those other brassica oleracea vegetables? Um, this is some scanning electron mic microscopy work of a vegetative meristem, early reproductive meristem, and then early, middle, and late um, heading stages. So what broccoli does uniquely is it has a developmental arrest at this early heading stage, followed by meristem proliferation, not unlike a broken copy machine that just keeps making all of these, these uh, floral primordia. So this is what um, uh, sort of an up close view of this uh, bad broccoli phenotype on the East Coast looks like. So you have sort of a mixture of these buds that were arrested at the fully mature stage and arrested at the, the early bud stage. Here's a more up close image of that phenomenon where some buds were able to escape and others got held back at an earlier stage. Um, so what are we looking at here? So this is a, a difference in a rest stage. What would you do if I told you that this is the same variety of Brassica oleracea? Uh, well, 
you'll have to take my word for it. It's a variety called Green Harmony, which is a tropical cauliflower that's very popular in Southeast Asia. And under warmer Southeast Asian conditions, you get this cauliflower phenotype. Um, under cooler conditions like New York, it very much produces a, something we would refer to as a head of broccoli, right? So this is clearly an example of gene expression under different temperature regimes. Um, and we know that that sensitivity to heat happens from the C to E stage, um, that the temperature conditions at that stage will have major implications on the ultimate um, heading phenotype. Um, there's a ton of research that has studied this question, and we don't have time to get into it. Um, Thomas and his grad student at the time, Denise Duclo, did a really nice work where they compared expression of floral identity genes in Arabidopsis to the broccoli heading model. And what they found is that the broccoli heading model is just simply more complex. Um, if anyone was lucky enough to see Chris Pierce talk last night, he talked about genome triplication. There's tends to be more copies of these homologous genes. Um, so we can't simply rely on what we know about Arabidopsis to work in the context of broccoli. Some other papers have come out recently that are really, really nice. Um, here, the authors are comparing expression of this flowering locust C gene, um, which is sensitive to vernalization under uh, war warm and cold conditions and comparing heat stressed, pardon me, heat susceptible and heat tolerant varieties. And they find evidence of differential expression of this FLC. Um, gene. Another paper came out and that shows uh, um, curd development in broccoli and they identify um, the role of FLC2 and FLC3 within um, different contexts. So there's, there's sort of a convergence on the role of FLC in this broccoli heading phenotype, but the, the story is not complete yet. Um, so, finally, to the experiment. Uh, so, we were able to use this really wonderful mapping population that was made from a cross between a Chinese kale and a broccoli. Um, the broccoli makes a head of broccoli, the Chinese kale does not, and the offspring segregate for kind of the degree of headingness as well as a lot of other really cool horticultural quality traits. Um, we did two field experiments in 2017 and 18. We generated molecular markers by using genotype by sequencing. Um, we ran QTL mapping using all of the above data. And then uh, I did the best I could to translate that knowledge that we gained and compare and contrast it with all of the other really great research that people are doing. So the canonical way of making a biparental mapping population is to cross parent A with parent B and then begin to consecutively self this F1 hybrid each time you increase the homozygosity of those lines. And by uh, eight rounds of selfing, you get over 99% homozygous lines. Um, I do not want to spend eight years in grad school if possible. <laughs> um, luckily, there is a really amazing shortcut called double haploid technology. And this is, a, this, is, this is a can of worms unto itself. Um, but in a nutshell, you can produce 100% homozygous lines in essentially one step. Um, uh, the way you do so is you take pollen, which exists in a haploid stage, and you do induce it to double, to make a double haploid. And then you use a tissue process culture to recover plantlets that have a double haploid um, genotype. So in this case, um, I cross, we, our, our group that wrote this paper uh, produced a double haploid population using a cross between this Chinese kale and a broccoli. Not, not a beautiful broccoli, but a broccoli nonetheless. 
and we produce over 200 double haploid lines um, that are really all over the map for this heading quality characteristics, right? As well as a lot of other traits. We grew them out beforehand and got a sense on how they were similar and different. Um, and use that information to determine the traits that we wanted to characterize in this population. So everything from the size of the flower buds to the shape of the head, uniformity of the flower buds. We looked at some leaf morphology characteristics. Some plants had very pointy leaves. Some plants had very serrated leaf margins, for example. Um, not necessarily important for broccoli, but for developing novel leafy greens classes. This could be useful information. Why not grab it? Um, bud morphology traits. Some had yellow flowers, some had white. Um, the shape of the bud might seem a little trivial, but multiply that over many different buds and it has pretty large consequences on the ultimate uh, shape of the head. And then head uniformity traits, head extension, et cetera. Um, this is, these are histograms of all of the phenotype data that I collected and typically you see a normal distribution, which is what you would expect under complex control, multiple genes lead to more quantitative results. However, flower color, we saw a very binary response where the flowers were either yellow or white. So strong evidence of single gene control. What was strange, however, growing this in the field is about 75% um, of the lines had white flowers and 25% had yellow flowers. In a double haploid population, you would expect a one-to-one -one segregation ratio for a single gene. So that was very difficult to get our mind around at the time, but hold that in your mind for a minute. Um, a consequence of this Eastern Broccoli Project where we've thought a lot about quality in horticultural crops is, is how to quantify it, that particular quality. So there's a statistical technique called relative importance analysis that allows you to um, evaluate something like overall quality, one to 10, how beautiful is a head of broccoli in terms of all of these other traits. And this technique allows you to consider both the contribution of a trait like head size or shape um, independently and in conjunction with all of the other traits. So um, I ran this analysis and unsurprisingly I found that head uniformity, compactness, head shape, and the bracting explains most of the horticultural quality. Um, we wrote a paper about this where we made a bunch of people look at the same field of broccoli and sort of parsed out uh, biases that people have when thinking about broccoli. And I and some collaborators made this into an R package. If you'd like to try it with your horticultural crop, feel free to do so. Um, genotyping followed a pretty canonical technique. We grew the plants in a greenhouse, extracted DNA, digested that DNA with a restriction enzyme, ligated it with a barcode, um, sent it off for sequencing, got back 35 gigabytes of data, and found about 168 million high quality reads in there. Um, that data got pumped into the tassel GBS to pipeline. I was very lucky that the best Brassica oleracea reference genome is in fact the Chinese kale parent that this um, population was made from. So I was able to align those reads to that reference genome and get really nice results due to that similarity. Um, I found about 264,000 SNPs after running this pipeline. Um, I wanted to whittle this down to the most informative, most high quality SNPs. Um, here you see uh, these sort of changes are likely recombination events that happened during the generation. Um, so there's a lot of redundant information that doesn't need to be kept. So how do you choose the best marker for any given recombination event? Um, that's where I spent a lot of time. Um, this is 
uh, the genotypes of all 200 lines as I was getting close to the end. Uh, these are these columns are the nine chromosomes of Brassica oleracea, um, and each row is one of the double haploid lines. And purple means it got the allele from the Chinese kale parent, and green means it got the allele from the broccoli parent. Um, there are some kind of weird glitches in here which turns out to be alignment errors. So I spent a lot of time trying to clean this out, like seeing if this particular marker was aligned to the wrong place in the genome, discarding it, or in some cases I was able to correctly assign it to its true location. Um, so this is the recombination frequency across all nine chromosomes, or linkage groups at this point, but whatever. Um, this is the genetic map that I made. Um, on the left, I've plotted it in terms of marker density, and on the right, this is just simply all of the markers in terms of uh, recombination frequency. Um, here, you see some regions have much higher marker density than others. These lower density regions typically correspond with centromeric regions where less recombination is happening. Um, what we are able to show, though, is for virtually every recombination event, we are able to find one marker. So we are pretty happy being able to basically get all of the information we possibly could out of this, out of this population. Um, you would expect a one-to-one -one segregation distortion where half of the plants got the allele from the broccoli, half got it from the Chinese kale. Um, and I plotted across each chromosome how this segregation works. And usually the results were, were pretty close to this one-to-one -one segregation pattern. We noticed certain regions were um, pretty significantly skewed, in some cases three-to-one segregation distortion. Um, keep that fact in your mind for a minute as well. Um, I followed, I, I used a uh, technique called multiple QTL mapping, which is really sort of an algorithm that helps you control for false discovery rates. It protects against overfitting. There's a tendency to just keep adding more and more QTL and explaining more of the variance in your model, which is not correct. Um, also, this technique protects against QTL that are in cu coupling or repulsion fees. Um, I'm gonna show a lot of, or a number of these QTL plots. This is, uh, the QTL peak um, showing the logarithm of odd scores, which has essentially the strength of association between the genotype and the phenotype. Um, this is a 95% significant threshold that's estimated from 1,000 bootstrap replications where I shuffle the phenotypic data and run the analysis over and over again. What's the odds of finding a peak given spurious data, essentially? Um, and then at the bottom, we have these nine chromosomes where I've aligned each marker underneath. Um, these are all 56 QTL for the uh, 25 traits that I looked at. Um, I also spent a lot of time trying to leverage all of the work done with other brassica crops um, and Arabidopsis work. So what I did is I made a clunky script that works um, that would estimate the 95% confidence interval in megabase pairs where a QTL began and ended. And then I use that to extract um, genes from the Brassica oleracea genome annotation. And then I ran that through a pipeline where it compared those genes against um, genes found in the online resource tear and ensemble plants. And that allowed me to conduct homology searches of different Brassica species or Arabidopsis, which was really useful. Um, so flower color is not an important horticultural quality trait per se, but we know it's single gene control. So I included it and I found one QTL that was located on the end of chromosome three. I'm gonna include some of these two-dimensional plots as well. And this shows epistatic interactions between genomic regions. So if we saw a yellow spot here, there would be an interaction between chromosome two and eight. 
um, we did not find evidence of epistasis, ep the, any epistatic interactions in, for this trait. Um, a paper recently came out where this group mapped this carotenoid degradation gene, uh, CCD4, to uh, chromosome 3 at about 56 megabases on that chromosome, which is this exact location. Um, so that was a really nice proof of concept that this pipeline was working, right? We were able to reproduce this um, finding. Also, uh, this region of the genome corresponds to strong segregation distortion where 75% uh, of the lines got the allele from the Chinese kale parent, which has white flowers. So that makes perfect sense um, to explain that three to one segregation pattern, which was um, great to see. Um, leaf waxiness has a pretty big implication on insect damage, insect resistance. Um, our population segregated for this. We found one QTL on chromosome nine uh, with some evidence of an epistatic interaction with other locations. Um, a really nice paper came out recently that described um, expression patterns of different wax biosynthesis genes in broccoli, and they identified a number of candidates that could be implicated. I ran, um, I identified those genes in the annotation and compared and contrasted that with my QTL mapping results, and I found this MAH1 uh, gene co-located with my the peak of my QTL, which is pretty neat. In fact, I found five very similar copies of it there as well. Um, and so it, again, it's important to note that this is not proof, it's just providing additional supporting evidence for future work. Um, this sepal tip uh, is, this is a really common defect that's seen in Eastern broccoli varieties. Um, this is uh, problematic, seems to be somewhat genotype specific. Um, I, within this population, I found a single QTL for that trait on chromosome one. Um, there is a paper that was studying some different brassica species that found what appears to be a fairly similar phenotype for that problem. And they um, said, they, they showed that uh, this gene AP2 was likely involved, and turns out that I found an AP2 copy very close to this QTL peak. Um, leaf margin, in terms of breeding leafy brassica greens, this could be a useful trait to have. Um, there's two, two papers I found that study brassica leaf margin. Um, one found this late meristem identity gene, and another found this uh, lobe leafed gene. Um, within my analysis, this LMI gene co segregated with this QTL peak. I didn't find evidence of this LL gene in my analysis. And that, I'm not saying that this result is wrong, it's that genetic variant doesn't seem to be present within this mapping population. Um, this is sort of an overhead view of those 56 QTL I found um, arranged in a similar way. So the vertical bar is the peak and then the horizontal is the 95% confidence interval. There are certain regions that seem to be pretty important. I'm calling these hotspots where I found the same QTL appearing for multiple traits. Um, and this one was the most interesting, HQ9 hotspot, where these pink, which are horticultural quality traits, and yellow, which is uh, days to, from transplant to, pardon me, days from transplanting to flowering and days from transplant to head maturity. So this something interesting is happening here. Um, this region of the Brassica ulracea genome is syntenic with Arabidopsis chromosome five, which contains a number of important flowering genes. Um, 
I did some previous work where I compared brassica, pardon me, broccoli land races on less improved varieties against modern F1 hybrids. And I studied um, the amount of linkage disequilibrium. So differences between this green and this purple line are um, evidence of selection for that particular genomic region. So, and chromosome nine was especially interesting. And I found these several hotspots where the modern hybrids have enriched linkage disequilibrium compared to the land races. And in fact, uh, this, this region, about 50 megabase pairs on chromosome nine seems to be uh, an example of that. So there's evidence that humans have been uh, inadvertently selecting for whatever allele is present there. Um, another paper that I was part of studied heat tolerance in broccoli and found a QTL in the same region on chromosome 9. Another really nice paper studied curd initiation in cauliflower under heat stress, and they found a QTL in this genomic region as well. So odds are something important is happening here. Um, some questions I had about this broccoli heading phenotype. Is it a single gene that controls it? Is it there, are there many genes? Is it a complex control? If it is complex, um, is it a conditional thing where you need the presence of many different genes? Um, or is there a small number of genes that control a larger number of traits? Um, th those are some questions that I had. This is an example of pleiotropic control where one gene is having, creating uh, implications for multiple other traits. So this is the uh, QTL mapping I did on head formation in broccoli. And I found um, four QTL. One of them was much larger than the other, than the others. Um, and then this peak corresponds with that head quality nine hotspot. Um, that provides evidence of complex control. This is not a five minutes. Okay, sorry, let me get to the end. And we found evidence of epistatic interactions as well, where uh, chromosome nine is interacting with other genomic regions. Um, pleiotropic control, this same hotspot has consequences for these other traits, head color or head compactness, uniformity, bracting. Um, so we can rule out the single gene hypothesis and show that there is probably strong pleiotropic control in this heading phenotype. Um, we found the FLC gene was located under that head quality nine peak. Um, and in a nutshell, we found 56 QTL, 10 regions that seemed to be important for high quality broccoli. Um, we are able to produce a really nice set of markers that other researchers can use when studying this population. We were able to explain this broccoli heading phenotype over 80% of the model variants. Um, we found support for this FLC1, the role of FLC1 in this heading and flowering time. And we showed that a pleiotropic model is probably very likely. Um, Thomas and Mark uh, were co-authors on the paper and our great Mark Farnham made the double haploids. Miranda and Aaliyah helped me a lot with the field work. Roberto, Dennis, John, Jacob Landis and Sandra all read the manuscript and gave me some really nice feedback. And the University of Wisconsin DNA sequencing facility uh, uh, did the um, sequencing. So any questions? I answered everything. That's all there is to know about broccoli. Just kidding. Yes, sir. Well, uh, yeah, I have to admit, I'm a little bit uh, unsure of this question, but I'll ask it anyway. So there was one uh, paper that you were a co-author on, 
had to do with temperature. Yes. And then that was tied in, I believe, with the hot spot on chromosome 9 that in the end it looks like that was uh, So what I'm wondering uh, is, uh, is it involved in the temperature effect? And the other thing I wanted to know is, uh, what kind of temperatures are we talking about here that result in the phenotypic effects? Great question. Um, that is, a uh, question that we're trying to answer with some follow-up research where we're growing heat sensitive and heat tolerant broccolis under hot and cold conditions and doing RNA-seq analysis. Um, so we, it's very likely that this uh, population experienced heat stress in the field trials. Um, we know that FLC is, um, very important in the vernalization process. It suppresses uh, downstream flowering time genes. Um, but the, the exact role that it plays is still, to my knowledge, ambiguous. Does that answer your question or? Well, uh, yeah, when you say vernalization, so now uh, is it a matter of whether it's uh, really cold versus getting modestly warm, or are we talking the higher end of the spectrum? Oh, right, right, what are the actual temperatures? So, um, similar to crops like apple and grape, um, brassica does have uh, vernalization requirements to flower. With broccoli, we know that that threshold is actually relatively high, so it begins to accumulate chilling hours um, below about 65 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, there is variation in how it will, how many chilling hours it needs to, to head amongst broccoli varieties. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a relatively high threshold that you need time below to form a head. Thank you, that's really helpful. Yep. Yes. Can you speculate at all about what H2 might be doing in terms of the sequel closing? Um, I did not spend a whole lot of time with that question. Um, I know that's directly in your wheelhouse. <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I don't know. I, you know, I was trying to wrangle 35 gigabytes of data and speak to the literature, what I could find, but Super interesting question. I, 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 I don't know the answer to it. Anna. What do you view as the future for these 56 some QTL and like what's their role in terms of integration and breeding programs in the future? Um, sure. I think from a, on an abstract level, just simply knowing more about why broccoli does its thing is helpful. Um, understanding the vernalization requirements and how that can be modulated can be very useful to breed more locally adapted broccoli varieties. Um, potentially stacking various sources of heat resistance into a variety could be helpful. Um, also, I don't know, maybe if someone wanted to just mix up all of the brassica ulracea vegetable types into new combinations, it might be nice to, uh, you know, have a map on how to do so. Just hypothetically, if someone had that idea. Any other questions that I can perfectly or not answer? Yes, sir. The most important question, and I saw that the per capita consumption of broccoli has gone down since you started working on this. We, <laughs> that's, that's, do you want to answer that one, Thomas? Yeah, somewhere around Thanksgiving 26, that went down. I don't know what world it has done. No, I don't, I don't know. Uh, it could be just that California is producing last due to water stress, drought, different economic factors, but I know there was some big price spikes that happened around that time as well. 
So maybe it was less attractive to consumers. I don't know. No more questions? This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.